All right, so hey there everybody, Andrew King here. I'm the editor of Canadian Musician and uh, thanks for joining us for our latest free webinar from NWC Webinars presented by Canadian Musician. Uh, you're here for creating a killer artist website and uh, in just a moment I'm gonna introduce Dave Cool. He is our guest presenter, the director of artist and industry outreach with bandzoogle.com. Um, I should mention at the outset here, so we're gonna be talking about best practices uh, for your website, regardless of which platform or service you're using. Uh, but to say at the outset here, check out bandsgoogle.com. Um, they have a number of really helpful designs and platforms that uh, will basically take a lot of what Dave's going to be talking about today and build it into their products. So you've got sort of a one-stop solution. Uh, yeah, catered to musicians and artists. So check them out. Uh, but beyond that, what we're going to be talking about is uh, pretty general and far-reaching. Um, before we get started, a few housekeeping tips. So the sessions, uh, we're aiming for about an hour here, and there's going to be two question periods. About halfway through, we're going to stop, uh, do a short little Q&A, basically just taking any questions that are particularly timely or, or relevant to something that Dave has already covered. Um, rest assured, though, if we don't get to yours in that initial handful, we've got a longer Q&A at the end of the session, and uh, yeah, we can be a bit more wide-reaching with that. So. Uh, fret not. You can ask your questions uh, in the interface there. You can just submit them and I'll be fielding those for Dave. Um, to start off, I guess we're going to ask a question. I'm going to start up a poll here. We're basically just looking to see uh, yeah, the makeup of our audience. Not so much so that we can steer today's session, but just to better inform uh, the future webinars that we bring you. Uh, NWCwebinars.com is the home base uh, for all of those. You can register for our next one. We're gonna be talking about capitalizing on music conferences uh, at the end of March. So uh, NWC webinars for that, CMW, ECMA, South by all right around the corner. And uh, we wanna help you make the most of your investment if you're going to such events. Um, yeah, I'll share these results with you momentarily, but it looks like the majority of our attendees are uh, performing and recording artists, which I guess makes a lot of sense because uh, we're helping you create a killer site. But to the 20% or so uh, behind the scenes industry professionals, I'm sure you'll be able to take away a lot here that will help you moving forward. Uh, last but not least, at the end of the session here, uh, we're going to throw up a link for our sister company, musicbooksplus.com, to a few additional uh, titles that are basically complementary subjects, uh, some books that will help you uh, expand on what we've spoken about today. There's also some tips there to make the most of your webinar experience. And uh, in the handouts tab, by joining us live, you're at... Uh, uh, eligible to grab some of these free resources. We've got handouts, uh, some articles that we've done in Canadian Musician, not so much talking about your .com website, but more your digital marketing strategy, social media presence, so some complimentary things to your .com. And that's enough for me. Uh, let's close the poll here. I'll just show you the results really quickly. So yeah, a little over half are performing recording artists. Uh, you can see a good segment of music industry professionals, some behind the scenes songwriters and some folks that are joining us uh, from other arms of the industry. We appreciate it. And let's get rolling here. Okay. So yeah, this is creating a killer artist website. My computer is being a bit slow, but let's roll. As I mentioned, I'm Andrew King with Canadian Musician Magazine. Dave Cool uh, is here, Director of Artists and Industry Outreach with Bandsoogle.com. Uh, some info here just about how they can help you build the site uh, in the lines of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, yeah, sell your stuff commission free. He has spoken on dozens of panels. We had a chance to connect at Canadian Music Week 2016. Actually, Dave's one of the first industry professionals that I had the pleasure of meeting and working with when I got the job at Canadian Musician back in the uh, standalone record days. So it's very cool. Coming full circle. Without further ado, Dave, thanks a ton for joining us. Uh, let's kick things off here. Um, so yeah, your website is your hub. And we've got a few reasons here of why you want to drive your fans to your .com, how your .com kind of plays an integral role in your online presence alongside your social media properties, email lists, etc. But uh, here we go. Four reasons to drive uh, fans to your website. And Dave, mind unpacking these a bit for us? Sure, no problem. And uh, it's good to be here, Andrew. I appreciate the invite. And hello, everyone listening. Um, 
Yeah, so it's a question that comes up often uh, for musicians that we speak to is, you know, in the age of free social media, why do you still need your own proper .com website? And it's a valid question, but there are some very good reasons uh, why you still need a website. Uh, primarily is that you own the address. You own that little slice of the internet. So if there's anyone listening who's old enough, I know I am, uh, that remembers when MySpace was the big social media <laughs> site. Uh, a lot of bands you know, spent a lot of time building up their fan base on MySpace, and then seemingly overnight, MySpace wasn't cool anymore. It was kind of broken, not working that well anymore. And there was no, you know, copy my fans from MySpace to Facebook. You really had to start over. And so by having your own .com, you really, you own that slice of the internet and your fans will always, the fans in the industry will always be able to find you there. So that's the first point. Um, you own the experience. So, you know, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram are all great tools and they have their place in your overall marketing strategy, of course, and they're very important. However, you don't really own the experience when someone goes to your profile, they're, they're all designed the same way. Um, and there's obviously reasons for that. And one would argue that MySpace's downfall had somewhat to do with their customization <laughs> options. But uh, so with your website, you can really design it how you want, brand it to match you know, your music, and you can really give fans the information and the experience that you want them to have uh, once they land on your site because you have complete control over that. Mm -hmm. um, these, this third point may be maybe not the most important, but it's, it's up there. Um, owning your data. So data has become somewhat of a new currency uh, for musicians and record labels and managers and bookers. And so the data that you collect through your website, like, um, you know, how many people are obviously visiting your website is important to know. It always feels nice. But more importantly, how did they get there? What did they search for? What link brought them there? Um, where do they live? And so these types of data points can really help you plan your marketing campaigns and it, in many cases help you book tours and, and shows. If you can show a booker at a venue that you have you know, X thousand fans in their city, and you can back it up with hard data, that's going to open up a lot of doors. And I've seen it firsthand at a Music Managers Forum Canada roundtable a few years ago where an artist manager was part of the roundtable with a promoter from Australia, and that artist manager just whipped out his laptop, went into the back end of his band's, the band that he was managing their website, and showed, hey, we get this much traffic from Brisbane, Australia, we need to talk, and they leaked immediately left the table <laughs> and went to go talk. So that's the power of data. It can really help you open doors. And in terms of that last point, earning money, I mean, if you're in, if you're playing music with the goal to monetize and make a career of it, then selling direct to your fans uh, through your website is important because you'll make more money. I mean, it feels great to get those sales reports from iTunes and Amazon and and other store CD baby, things like that. But they're all taking a cut of those sales and getting back to the data point, um, iTunes is not sharing data with you. They're not sharing the email addresses uh, of those customers. That Those are their customers. What you wanna do is drive the sales to your website where you get more of the money in, you know, you mentioned in the intro, like Ben Zugel's commission-free sales, and there's services like Bandcamp where they take a small, small cut and, and give you the full data, like the email address, and the, you know, so you can follow up with those fans over the long term. Which I think probably segues into <laughs> the next slide. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you know, earning more money um, and getting that data are super important. So, yeah, that that brings us to mailing lists. Bingo. Oh, let's, uh, let's keep the train rolling here. And uh, yeah, mailing list kind of a subsection of your website, but uh, an important component, especially when you're talking about um, making sales directly from your platform. Uh, so let's chat about this and then we can roll back into the uh, website itself. Sure, yeah. So we, like you said, like we, we really see the website and mailing list going hand in hand. Like we see your website as your hub online and all these other th social media platforms are kind of your spokes and you really want to drive, use those, social profiles to drive traffic and drive fans to your website so you can collect that data. And part of that is collecting the data through your mailing list. Um, and mailing lists might sound a bit like an old school <laughs> marketing tactic, um, but they are 
in our opinion, the most powerful marketing tool that musicians have. And the reasons for that is that you own it. So you own that database of fans. MySpace can disappear, Facebook can disappear, Twitter can disappear. If you have a solid mailing list, you own that database. So let's say you're using MailChimp for your mailing list. You can download that database and let's say you're gonna build a website with Banzoogle, upload it to our mailing list system, use our mailing list. If you decide to change, you can download the database, take it with you, you own that database. So that's extremely important. Second point is, if someone gives, a, gives you their email address, especially these days, um, where people are really wary of spam and getting too, too many emails, if someone, if I give my email address to a band, it's because I want to hear from them. I want to know when their new album is coming out. I want to know when they're going on tour. So I want to know about their career. So it's really the ultimate permission marketing, which is, I think, a Seth Godin term. Mm. Uh, best way to sell. So this is really important. So. A lot of musicians and artists focus so much of their time on social media, and again, super important to connect with fans, find new fans, engage with your fans. However, people generally aren't on social media to shop. They're there to hang out, look at stupid memes, and talk to their friends. They're not really there to, to shop for things. Whereas with a mailing list, if you send a direct email to a database of fans that have signed up voluntarily. You should never add people who haven't, that's a very important point, never add people that haven't signed up to your list. If you send them a dedicated email blast saying, hey, my new album, my new album is out, click here to buy, you are gonna have so much more success with that than shouting on Twitter for you know a month. And there was a study released last year by a marketing firm that measured sales on social media platforms versus dedicated email blasts. And it, the study showed that email was 40 times more effective as Facebook and Twitter combined when it came to strictly monetizing. So very important tool. And if you don't have a mailing list and you're listening to this, please start one. <laughs> All right on. That is a staggering figure, 40 times more effective than the two major platforms combined. Um, yeah, well, let's keep rolling here. Uh, so back to the dot com. And uh, yeah, rest assured, we're going to be getting into, you know, specific design elements in the second half. We just really want to st uh, set the stage here and uh, yeah, just kind of uh, give you an all encompassing look at the importance of having not just a good website, but a, a website at all. So uh, yeah, let's keep rolling. Um, the three groups of people that you are targeting with your site, and we break these down a bit. Yeah, so when you're putting together a site, or if you're thinking of redoing your website, you, you have to think about the, these three categories of people that are going to be visiting your site. And you have potential fans, you have your current fans who already know you, and then you have industry and media, and they all have very different needs. Um, so an example of a potential fan would be someone, let's say, you know, you mentioned, Andrew, that you guys are doing a webinar on, on getting the most out of conferences, which is super important. Mm -hmm. um, conferences can be a great thing, but they can also, they're also an investment of time and money. Um, so let's say you're showcasing at a conference. Let's say you, got, you have a showcase slot at uh, CMW. Someone might be going to that venue that night to see a band that's playing after you, but they might check out your website to see, is it worth showing up a bit early to see another band on the bill? So your website really has to speak to the needs of a potential fan, someone who doesn't really know you very well. Your current fans are gonna be checking out your website for different reasons, more, they already know who you are, so they're gonna to wanna to know what's new, <laughs> and is there any new merch, is there anything, you know, where are you playing next, that kind of thing. And then industry and media, so that could be podcasters, bloggers, uh, magazines, newspaper, journalists, um, bookers, festival bookers, venue bookers, managers, you know, agents, labels, that kind of thing. They have very different needs as well, and so you have to organize the content on your website so that all of three categories of these visitors can quickly find the information that they're looking for because they're all going to click in a different place first, <laughs> guaranteed. So you really have to make it um, super clear. Yeah, very good fun. point. Very good point. Um, and here we go. We're just going to kind of uh, unpack this even more and look at some of those components of the site that are going to appeal to those three different categories. Uh, and so you can see some of the overlap and, and kind of decide uh, – 
well, this will all go towards helping you logically uh, organize your site and the experience. So, uh, yeah, we started last time with potential fans. Great example with CMW, by the way, because I am that exact person uh, that uh, I'm trying to find if I can uh, piggyback seeing a new band on the back of one I know and kind of like uh, hitting two birds with one stone. But uh, I digress. Uh, potential fans. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. And so potential fans are going to know who, what are you all about? What's your story? Who are you? Um, you're going to want to put your best song, your best video right up front, right on the homepage when someone lands on your site. And if they're curious enough uh, about who you are, again, um, hammering down this point on mailing list, try to get them on your, your mailing list with some kind of, you know, the, the standard offer is a, a free download. Personally, I think it's not enough anymore. <laughs> I think that you really have to think about exclusivity. So we have some fans of members who offer older albums, like complete albums in exchange for an email address to sign up to their mailing list. They offer exclusive live EPs or something exclusive that you can't find anywhere else. Um, but again, just trying to entice people to, to get on that mailing list. Um, yeah, current fans, folks that are coming because they already know and like you. Yeah, exactly. So they already know your story. They already know who you are. So they're going to want to know what's new. Um, a great way to do that is through blogging. Blogging is also great for search engine optimization. Um, and, you know, your photo galleries, you can embed you know, your Twitter feed, your Instagram feed, so they can quickly see your latest activity. And these are people who probably already own your music. Um, so they may want to see, like, are there, is there new merch? Um, package deals, uh, are you crowdfunding? So these, your current fans, the ones that already know you are really gonna be the, the life force behind any kind of crowdfunding campaign. And again, if they're not on your mailing list, they really should be, and so you should try to capture them as well while they're on your website. Bingo, and then uh, I guess, yeah, you're kind of uh, preaching to the choir a bit here with me, but uh, <laughs> no, it's good for people to know. Uh, so the industry media, I guess both of us actually. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I used to book a couple of venues up here, here in Montreal, and you know, the way I browsed artists' websites is, was very different. Um, you know, industry and media—they want to know what's unique about you, what's different about you, what have you accomplished. Again, you want to put your best stuff forward. So obviously creating out some kind of EPK or digital press kit page is the easiest way to accomplish this on a website because then they can just click on that section and get all the information they need, which is they want to know, they want to see your bio, um, putting high res photos, high quality images, different formats, different, um, black and white color, horizontal, vertical, you never know, like, the easier you can make their lives to do, to cover you, to re do a review, um, the better. So having all of that in one place, your music, latest videos, press quotes, of course, um, contact information, career highlights, um, contact info, you can have it right there on the Prescott page just to make it easier. If you have a publicist, obviously they put their contact information if they want to contact. I know some people in the media who prefer to deal with publicists, others just want to hear straight from the band, so having both is probably not a bad idea. And in terms of press quotes, one thing I will mention is the tendency is very much to just put a bunch of text of like reviews and quotes, which is great. That's definitely a, a very good first step. But what you can do to augment that is to make it a little bit more visual and a little anecdote. I was doing a website review for someone at the ASCAP Expo in Los Angeles last year, and they had this really long press kit page and there were just a ton of reviews. And so when you landed on it, like you just saw just so much text and had I not been reviewing the website, I wouldn't have really looked that closely, but because I was reviewing the website, I decided to read through the reviews. And I mean, there's Billboard and Pitchfork and all these major media outlets. And I was like, you should really add the logo <laughs> of the media outlet um, and then a quick quote and then a link to the full article rather than putting it all in text because someone landing on that, that page may not appreciate the different media outlets. And some of them were really, you know, pretty big media outlets. So making it visual, making it pop, making it stand out in some way so that someone can get a really quick snapshot of like, oh, this person's been reviewed by some of the top, you know, music media in the world. 
you know, that that sets a tone, um, you know, for, for your career when someone's landing on that page. Mm -hmm. um, quick question, uh, and this is me asking. Uh, so I can think of a few artists who on their site openly link to an EPK or press materials. It's called different things, but where you can go there, where anyone can access uh, and download high-res images, see the bio or one sheet, high-res album art, uh, etc. And then I know some artist sites as well where they have all that set up, but they will either have it password protected or just not publicly listed, so they have to actually send you the link. Um, I'm just wondering if, in your opinion, one approach is more effective than the other. Uh, is there any potential harm or can it be a hindrance to just publicly have those press materials accessible from your main page? So, personally, I think it should always be publicly accessible. I think you never know who's going to be landing on your site, and you want to put all that information up front. Um, I do understand, and, and you know, in our platform you can password protect pages, and we have a lot of members who do that for their, their press kits, and I do understand that, and especially if you're going to include on that Prescott page full album downloads for free so the media can review the album, yeah. then yes, password protecting might not be a bad idea. And what you it's sort of a compromise could be, you know, having a publicly accessible Prescott page and then having a note saying if if you're a member of the media and would like a, you know a full download of music, you know, click here to contact us and then you send them to a password protected page. For those that are interested, if they're doing it, especially for album reviews and things like that, so I totally understand wanting to password protect some of that content, obviously. But I think some of it really should be upfront and accessible to anyone that lands on the site. All right, on. I no, appreciate that. I'm um, I'm in that camp as well. Like you say, you never know who's coming, and there have been times where, just by the nature of publishing and media, where you know you're after something instantaneous and if you can't get your hands on it simply it's off to the next thing so uh, yeah there's some artists that have benefited from having that there um, so yeah like I said before I'll just preface it as soon as uh, we wrap up this short question period here we're going to be getting into the look the layout of your site the actual design elements which is why I'm sure a few of you came um, but yeah, feel free. Let's fire some questions. Again, you can send them via text in your interface there. Uh, there are a few good ones here to put in front of Dave. Um, I've got to think, and I know you've done this presentation before uh, at some high profile events. This is probably, if I'm onto something, the most common question you get. So uh, hoping you've got something in your back pocket. And I might throw some in there as well. Uh, but what are examples of good artist websites? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, uh, I, I, the, the easiest way for me to answer that would be <laughs> is somewhat shameless self-promotion um, would be to go to bandsigle.com and we have an examples section that's one of our main menu items and you can go and see a variety from all different genres and styles and artists from around the world. All the examples we put up there are, you know, sites that are built beautifully and follow you know these these best practices. We also have a blog category um, where we feature beautiful band websites, and so there's just every week we you know we talk about them. So for now, I would say check out uh, Tyler Keeley, who's a singer songwriter based in Ottawa. <clears throat> He's one of our members, and he has a great website. Uh, it always always looks good. Um, there's a guy named John Hart in the UK. John Hart Music. His website always looks great. Um, but yeah, I mean there 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 are a lot of examples out there, but uh, those are the two that kind of come front front of mind. Oh, right on. Yeah, if I can throw one in there too, and I've just realized that he's got a new album on the way, so I'm not sure if it's changed uh, for this cycle, but Joel Plaskett, um, well-known awesome. Canadian troubadour. I always liked his site. Uh, the aesthetic was changed to match each album cycle, but it always suited his brand. I mean, sometimes it was very uh, kind of busy looking, but at the same time, if you know Joel, if you've seen his studio or album work that kind of fits the aesthetic um, of his brand. And just a side note too, he's one of the people that I know have all of the press materials uh, accessible from the main page. And what's brilliant is that on there too, he includes very high res files of show posters uh, for whatever tour he's on, basically enabling his fans 
if they feel so inclined to access those materials and uh, essentially become his street team uh, if there's shows coming to his area, which I've got to think has uh, has worked well for him. Um, I should say too, Dave. I'm just gonna I'm gonna throw some questions at you. Some of these are really good. Um, as they say, a wise man doesn't have all the answers, but knows where to find them. So uh, if we stump you, rest assured that I will take it upon myself um, to answer people's questions because this one's pretty technical. Uh, but let's see what we can do. Um, yeah, someone wants to know how can a webmaster amalgamate site sales, uh, direct music sales from their .com in PayPal to adhere to SoundScan's rules uh, so that they can be recognized for chart positions, uh, total album sales, et cetera, which go a long way for funding opportunities and the like? Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, I know on our platform, we do report sales in North America for SoundScan. And we do connect through PayPal for those sales. How, the technical side of that and how that all works, I am the wrong guy to ask. Unfortunately, <laughs> that was uh, probably I could I could find out. It was our developers who put that system together, but um, it, it definitely is possible because we've been reporting the SoundScan now for a few years, and uh, all of our payment processing is done through PayPal um, through through our e-commerce features, which are skin, obviously you know part of the website design, and then for the actual processing. You do it through PayPal, and then you get the downloads, or the person sends the the CD or what have you, um, and then every week we send the the sales reports to SoundScan. So it, it is definitely possible with the technical aspects of how to do that. Let's say if you're doing it through like a WordPress custom WordPress site, I'm not a hundred percent certain. Okay, well then uh, I am a king a k i n g at n o r dot com. If you're still after more information, just uh, shoot me a message, and we can look into that. Um, here we go. Uh, someone's asked about books or articles to read. So if I can shamelessly promote, uh, at the end of the session, Penny, we're going to have three titles, um, three books that have some complimentary info to what we're talking about here. As far as articles, if you check out the handout section of your webinar interface, we've got a few over the years that uh, don't exactly pertain to this topic, but uh, are complimentary talking about your overall digital marketing strategy, your online presence, etc. cetera. Uh, but with that, Dave, do you have any uh, favorite titles that you can recommend to people along this line? Uh, definitely, and, and again, I apologize for the self-promotional aspect of it. Is it, my main role at Banzoogle has been for the last six years uh, artist education, and so Banzoogle's blog every week we publish three to four articles, um, not only on website best practices, but you know general marketing advice or artist you know career advice that kind of thing. But we have a bunch of free eBooks on the blog. We just launched a new one called A Complete Guide to SEO for Musicians. It's a 130 page free ebook all about SEO. Um, there's one, it's a step-by-step -step guide, you know, how to build a website for musicians. Again, very general advice. You don't have to be using Banzoogle. It's just overall best practices. So there's a bunch of free downloads on the on the blog. Besides the blog post, there are some actual ebooks that you can download totally for free and um, will uh, will help you out on, with your online presence. Okay, um, I've got a Banzoogle specific uh, question, which I guess I'll save for the end here. And remember, um, there are a few questions in the queue just popping in now. Uh, rest assured, we'll get those uh, answered and in front of Dave uh, very, very shortly. Uh, but one more and then we'll truck on here. Um, yeah, for WordPress sites, uh, and I'm not sure if you have an opinion, but would you recommend Dan? Uh, acquiring data analytics via the server backend or via inside WordPress's template uh, and plug in inside WordPress as opposed to direct hosting statistics, cPanel statistics? Huh. I honestly do not have an opinion, uh, mostly because I don't know enough of the technical, technical aspects of how that would work. Um, we we plug in Google Analytics and then we add in some data on top of that, but um, I'm not quite sure the difference is there for, for a WordPress site. I apologize. Um, I think as long as you can set it up easily and have access to and will forever have access to that it's not something that you have to pay to keep getting access to. Um, you know, like something like Google Analytics where you can create an account and you'll always have access to that data. 
then um, if it's easily accessible, then I, you know what, whichever way works best for you. But unfortunately, I don't know enough about those two different ways of handling it with WordPress. Well, okay. Um, yeah, I, I know it's not the greatest help just to say Google, but uh, knowing how robust Google Analytics platform is and that it can be plugged into a number of, uh, of different platforms and services, uh, I think even just Googling WordPress Analytics versus others, um, you probably get a lot of good peer reviews and could kind of crowdsource information on that, uh, which might be the best for, for folks that have used and have experience with uh, uh, yeah, using a few of these different tools. But again, aking at nor.com, we will get you helped out. Uh, okay, so let's carry on here. And now we're going to talk about the actual site. So um, I guess we're kind of starting at square one. We've set the stage very nicely. Appreciate all of your insight, Dave. Let's talk about the site, the assets that you want to have uh, included. Yeah, so if you're getting ready to build a new website, or even if you already have a website, like th these are kind of the main components. Um, you know, if you I like to tell people, it's not the official company slogan of Banzoogle, but I tell people Banzoogle so easy your drummer could do it, which is true because I'm a drummer, but um, you really have to have some things in place before you build a website. And those things are, you know, your official bio, which should be written, you know, in the third person, maybe a few different versions of it, short, medium, long, elevator pitch, that kind of thing. Professional photos cannot stress this enough. Um, we tell musicians that they should invest more money in photos than they do in their website. And the reason for that is, is that you're going to use those photos on your website, in your press kit, on your social media profiles. So the difference between landing on a website that has professional photos and one that doesn't, I mean, it's night and day. And the unfortunate reality is that people are going to judge your music based on the visuals that they immediately see, whether it's conscious or unconscious, subconscious, they, they're, they're going to make a judgment on your music based on the visuals. So if your visuals are grainy and poorly cropped and unprofessional, they're going to think the same about your music before ever, before ever hitting play on a music player. So professional photos, super important. Obviously you need some music put up there your videos, upcoming dates, social links, and contact information. So that, that'll give you the bulk of the content you need to build a site that will address, you know, um, a lot of those um, people, that, the three different categories of people that will be visiting your website. Bingo. And that's not to say you have to limit it to this, although as we'll talk about in a sec, you definitely don't want to throw too much at it. Um, Spartan and simple is key. Um, but yeah, if you've got one or two, say a charity or campaign or something like that you want to add in here, probably makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, design tips. So we were just talking a bit about uh, professional photography and you hit the nail on the head. That's something that can be very off-putting, you know, first impressions. There's a ton of adages about that and well, they apply very directly to uh, your .com here. But yeah, photos, colors, typography and fonts. Uh, walk us through this. Yeah, so photos, I already gave my little rant on the importance of professional photos because, you know, you're going to use that for your header, background images, promo photos, social media press, get all that stuff. So um, in terms of color, so if you don't, if you're designing it yourself, um, it's probably good to stick to three colors as a general rule. There are, of course, going to be exceptions, um, but generally speaking, unless you're doing children's music, you don't want to have like 15 colors. Um, on your website. You want to try to focus it um, so that it looks cohesive. Um, so you're going to have a primary color, maybe that is a color from your logo if you have one, a secondary color, and then a, th you know, a, th a third accent color that you know complements one of the first two colors. So think about you know the, the background colors, the link colors, um, the header text colors, things like that. So it all has to look cohesive. Um, to look like a professional website. So sticking to three colors, you're probably going to be doing okay. Um, again, you can play off of shades of that, and um, but generally speaking, if you stick to three colors, you're going to be doing okay. In terms of typography, I'll give an example. I mean, I did a website review for a metal band that had Comic Sans as the body text that was colored purple, yellow, red, like it was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. I was like, guys, you play like really dark, heavy music. Like your website is screaming like 
bubbly children's fun music. Oh, <laughs> so I, I like, was seeing Geo <laughs> Cities and <laughs> getting it back. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Or it looks like Geo Cities. So, you know, avoiding, if you're not sure, just uh, people often pick, uh, and, and I'm picking on Comic Sans because it's the easy thing to do, but there are other fonts like that that are just kind of, they look kind of designy, like they look a bit different. But really, if, you, if you're not sure, and you can, of course, Google, you know, font best practices um, and just pick some good quality classic fonts and you generally can't go wrong but you can go very wrong by picking you know some of the other ones uh, making sure that there's good contrast with the background so I come across so many websites where there's you know light gray text on a dark background and it's impossible to read the content in the bio and the blog posts and things like that. And things like center justification, bold italics, you want to keep that to a minimum. Um, center justification is one that I see a lot for body text. Um, and the reality is, is that it's actually harder to read because your eye has to keep trying to find the beginning of the sentence again. Where it does work for quick one-line reviews or press quotes, that's great. Uh, same thing with bold and italics, but you don't want to have too much of it because it, it'll just kind of distract. And of course, avoiding all caps uh, for body text because it's just going to seem like you're shouting at people. Yeah. Oh, I can't think of the name and uh, pull it up, but with, to Comic Sans, I would add, add that uh, just totally overdone bleeding cowboy or the cowboy one with like. <laughs> That's the one I was trying to think of, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I see that everywhere. And oh, you're tying yourself to a weight and jumping into the lake that um yeah. okay it's not that serious uh, okay let's roll um and this is a very important one that i know uh you are going to want to stress so mobile friendly and it's almost self-explanatory but please yeah i mean i think at this point everyone knows how important it is um to have a mobile friendly website but you know digital media time is now higher on mobile devices than on desktop um that's a very sort of recent occurrence um and so the mobile experience has to be seamless. Like, and to know a very quick way to know if your website is mobile friendly is if you're looking at your website on a phone. If you have to pinch and zoom, your website's not mobile friendly. So, the content has to be easy to find. It has to be easy to navigate. If you're selling, any kind of e-commerce has to work seamlessly. And the reality is now Google boosts mobile friendly pages and will actually punish pages that aren't. Uh, mobile friendly if someone's doing a search in a mobile device um, and you can go to google.com their webmaster tools you can plug in your URL and they'll give you an, uh, an assessment of how mobile friendly uh, your website is so it's a good idea just to check it out uh, but again a, a quick test is if, if you have to do any kind of pinch and zoom on your website on a mobile device it is not mobile friendly you should probably um, switch your template or design or platform that you're using to make sure that um, that it's being um, that it's a, a responsive, mobile-friendly uh, design. Bam! Uh, that bolded URL at the bottom again, where you can test that. And uh, a great time as any to mention a recording of this session will be sent out to everybody that registered, uh, including the attendees here, so that you can access this uh, at your convenience when needed at any point from here on out. Um, but also to say that in the handout section, there is a notepad style breakdown of this particular slideshow where you can grab that. So, well, if you were writing it down, you're probably done by now, but uh, save you a bit of writing. Um, yeah, there's some great questions coming in here, uh, which we'll be getting to shortly, but let's keep rolling here. We're talking about the look. Uh, let's talk about the experience, navigation experience. Yeah, so it's important to make navigation as easy as possible. And, you know, you should probably limit your main menu to maybe eight sections. Um, it can be a little bit less than that, um, may, but not much more than that because if you have like a dozen or 15 different main menu sections, chances are you're overwhelming people and they're not really going to know where to click. Um, cause, and each section should have a cl one clear purpose. So your music page shouldn't also have your bio. Um, your shows page shouldn't have all your videos at the bottom, that kind of thing. So every section should have one clear purpose. And it's super important to keep the name simple. Um, you know, we often say that, you know, your music is your art, your website is your business. And so, you know, leave the creativity aside when you're naming your, your main menu items because, you know, we come across, you know, main menu pages called like Discover or Explore and, and or something, you know, totally unique. and 
the reality is people, everyone has ADD these days with social media. <laughs> if they land on your website and they want to find your upcoming shows, make sure that they can very quickly find your upcoming shows. So that's the idea. Spot on. Um, geez, we're rolling on here, which I guess is good because we have a ton of really good questions uh, in the queue. Um, and yeah, I guess we can break. I guess we chatted about these earlier, uh, but yeah. did we, I guess, got into detail too. Uh, so as far as like your site map itself and basically just the tabs as to where people can go from the main page, um, again, this is kind of a, a good general starting point and you can interchange some of things that are relevant or unique to you with this, but all kind of going with uh, Dave's point of keeping it simple, drive people's attention where you want it, uh, don't go overboard. Is there anything to add on these points? No, yeah, like you said, you can like you can take away some of these. Maybe add like you can add Prescott to that and combine music and store if you're, you want to have everything in one place or photos and videos into like a media section that kind of thing. But generally speaking, these are going to hit all the points that someone would be visiting your website for. Brilliant. Okay. Wow, that kind of uh, sailed by, but um, it is all good because we, like I say, well, I keep saying we've got some great questions, and I'm always impressed uh, to the folks, especially the regular attendees. I'm seeing some familiar names here. We very much appreciate uh, you coming and just keeping the caliber of interaction very, very high. Uh, so, again, we've got to disclose here that Dave is with Banzoogle.com, which is a service that offers website and retail solutions uh, and email solutions for bands, for musicians and artists. Um, and so I say that just so that, uh, you know, we tried to keep it agnostic. Banzoogle.com, check it out. Uh, but some of these questions, we might just kind of have to dance around that a bit. Um, but, yeah, someone's asking about... Uh, if you can objectively, and that's my word, not theirs, but share some uh, pros and cons to using free sites like Wix uh, versus, well, any of a lot of the other options available. I guess if we can boil that down, um, you know, sometimes free is all someone can afford. Uh, what are the pros and cons of, of going that route? Yeah, so Wix has a free plan. Like they're one of our our big competitors out there. I mean, we're very different companies. We're 100% focused on musicians and bands, and Wix is kind of a website platform for for anyone that wants to build a website. And you know, they have a free tier, which I understand sometimes. You know, um, you don't have the, the resources to invest uh, in a website. The, the the issue with a free platform, a free tier of platform like that, like Wix, is they're gonna just place ads for Wix all over it. <laughs> and so when someone's coming to your website, I mean, it's it's going to, as a starting point, maybe, but once you start getting professionals and bookers and media coming to your website and they, they land on a website that's plastered with Wix ads and it maybe doesn't have a custom domain, you know, it's like a, a it's like a Wix.com slash or your band name dot Wix.com, that kind of thing. It, it kind of brings the the sort of professionalism level down a little bit. That's probably the only the, the biggest knock against using um, a, a free uh, service like that. Mm -hmm. um, and and actually, I can say too. I, I'm not sure if this is for Wix, but with a lot of these um, providers, the free tier doesn't come with a clean band name dot com. There's often uh, uh, some extra characters in that URL, um, and even that alone uh, is something that you know it's not going to be a deal breaker in a lot of cases. But uh, you want to put your best foot forward. You want to be professional. You're competing with more artists and sites than ever before, and that's pretty much going up daily. So uh, yeah, you want to capitalize on any edge you can. And uh, well, yeah, if we, if yeah. we well, oh, sorry, sorry, one more. One more point on that is is in terms of search engine, like SEO could be a complete, you know, obviously its own webinar, uh, search engine optimization. But in terms of SEO, Google wants to know where like your main hub online is, and so you re you really need a custom domain primarily for that reason as well. Like Google wants to know, okay, what's your okay, you're this band, fine. What's your main hub online? And they want that to be your own .com, not a you know platform name .yourband .com. 
that kind of thing. So it's 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 important for for SEO considerations as well. Oh, spot on. Um, yeah, there's quite a few questions here about money. Um, mm -hmm. And so again, like I, I know you can speak very uh, well to banzoogle.com. Um, and that's not a, I guess, not a bad thing just for comparative here. But a few folks are asking about kind of average price that you should expect to pay. Uh, and I guess we can kind of break that down, like just to basic hosting um, you know, what it might cost or even a ballpark to have someone design and host your site all in one versus a package like Banzoogle targeted with widgets for musicians specifically. Can you give us a little bit of a breakdown? And I should quote Ian here too. Uh, I guess I'm just going to add on to the question and complicate it a bit, but they all kind of ride together. Um, yeah, there's a, a gentleman here that's paid close to $20 a month since 2007 for his present website and he's just not getting anything out of it is it possible to transfer uh that site or even just the dot com address and take advantage of a service like banzoogle um yeah so i'll just that first because it's very quick thank you definitely um you know if you have a website you already have your own custom domain we include one in all the plans and we we manage those and, and you, you own them, but we renew them every year for you. Uh, but if you already have a .com, you can, you know, you can build a website during the free trial and then when you're ready, you can point your custom domain over to our servers. That's not an issue uh, whatsoever. To the initial question of, you know, a comparison of costs, I mean, it varies widely as you can imagine. Like you can find hosting for dirt cheap. There's no question. You can find hosting for a couple bucks a month. You could, Slap together, you know, free WordPress template. If you if you kind of know what you're doing, you can do some custom code. You can build a website for for relatively cheap. You're gonna have to find widgets to do the e-commerce and the mailing list and you know gig dates and all those other things. Like there's a, there's a patchwork of things that you can put together and for it to be super low cost. There's no question. Um, where services like Banzool and others that that offer similar services come in is it's all in one place so your design you can change the design instantly it's all mobile friendly you get your hosting and we we use Amazon's uh, web, web services so the hosting super quick super reliable um, so we don't use cheap hosting and you know many of our competitors are the same way they they use you know top line hosting um, and then you get your e-commerce email that's all in one place and yet and so you're going to pay anywhere from 10, 15 to 20 bucks a month for a service like Banzoogle. Um, but then you get your seven day a week support included. Um, so it depends on your level of comfort with tinkering and how much time you have. If you want to try to customize a WordPress template and, and embed all these widgets, um, if you know your way around, you know, your hosting and setting up email and that kind of thing, then yeah, there's, there's definitely a way to do that um, on the cheap. And if you're going to hire a designer to customize, let's say a WordPress uh, template, that can range, depending on what you need, um, that can range anywhere from 500 bucks to five grand to, you know, more than that, depending on, on what you want to do with your site. But uh, I'd say between five and, and 2000 sort of as a, minimum of getting a designer involved to uh, to custom code and brand a website um, that would probably be what it would cost well thanks a ton for that um, yeah there's probably four or five questions I think um, all basically going for the same thing so appreciate your uh, insight here's a great one um, what are some tips for avoiding cart abandonment which is a pretty big issue for a lot of e-retailers Cart abandonment. So that would be when someone adds something to the cart and then, then leaves the site. Is that? Yeah. So I, if someone's on your site and and uh, like Banzoogle offers uh, e-commerce uh, tools, mm -hmm. it would be yeah that stage where someone's purchasing something, they've added it to their cart, and at some point between adding items, especially multi items is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. But where at some point between choosing those items and not hitting okay on the credit card information, is that something that you guys have even looked at much internally? Because I know there are a lot of kind of general 
uh, stats and statistics and tips about that that you can find online. But uh, here we are, you know, with the service provider specific to the music industry. Um, yeah, is that something that uh, that you folks have looked at at all? Uh, to be honest, not really, because often when someone's going onto a musician's website, I mean, it's the very direct purpose. And if they decide to buy something, it's usually a very quick transaction. Whereas, you know, if you're on a e-commerce site like like Amazon or something like that, you can get kind of lost in the in the weeds a bit and then forget about it. And, and you know, we don't. I don't have any data at my fingertips to know how much of an issue that may or may not be for our. I and mean, we have over thirty thousand. Uh, musicians that use the platform, so I'm not sure how much of an issue it is. Um, I would imagine it does come up, but that that kind of goes back to the importance of of getting as many people who visit your website onto your mailing list. Because if they do forget, then they'll hopefully get an email from you within a, a month or two, just reminding people that your music and merch and and that kind of thing. But uh, in terms of technically how how do we address that issue? I'm, um, I honestly don't know. Um, it's it's uh, it's one of the first times I've, I've in six years working with Benzie. It's the first time this that question has been has been raised. But maybe as musicians become more savvy and are doing more direct fan commerce, it, it may be becoming um, more of a concern. All oh, right, on uh, and actually, yeah, and you made a great point too. The card abandonment is is I guess more uh, talked about at least for sites like Amazon. Um, where people are essentially coming to shop slash browse, where, like you say, a, a musician's web store, very often people kind of know what's there already and would be coming uh, with a purpose. Um, here, let's keep rolling here. Uh, now, this is an interesting one, and I guess more opinion-based than anything, but if you perform as a solo artist as well as part of a band, uh, are there advantages to having a single site as opposed uh, to multiple sites for each different project, just apart from the individual costs? Yeah, that's a great question. That's one that comes up uh, quite a bit. Um, so my personal opinion is that it's not absolutely necessary to have separate websites. It really depends what your focus is. Um, that being said, for again, for SEO and to keep things kind of separate, um, you know, having uh, separate websites is probably a good idea. Um, it depends on your budget, of course, and if you want to invest in that. And you can definitely connect the two, the, the multiple sites, and you know. I come across a lot of musicians who also do production and they're producers and also solo artists or they teach and also do original music and how do you, or play in cover bands and how do you separate those entities and the clearest way is to have separate websites um, and if you're going to go with a single website my only advice would be that whatever your primary focus is, whatever you focus the most of your time and attention on, make that the primary focus of your website and make sure that there's a section for the other thing that you do, whether it's teaching, whether it's a solo project or a cover band or whatever. Um, so it's, it's really, um, that, that was my personal opinion, but it really, unfortunately, <laughs> it's a bit of a cop out, but I, I always throw it back to the artist asking the question saying like, it's really, it's a matter of personal preference and how you want to sort of divide your career, so to speak, um, or not. So it's really, there's no, I, I don't think there's really a best practice, like you have to have separate websites or you have to have a single website. I think it really comes down to time, resources, budget, and, um, and, and how you want to kind of manage those entities online. Oh, right on. Um... Yeah, and I should uh, say, too, we've had some great questions. Dave, I appreciate you humoring us, too, with some of the more kind of technical slash back-end uh, questions. You know, we were, our intent was to look more so at the design elements and kind of the front-facing user experience of your website, um, more so versus things like analytics and, uh, and your web store and whatnot. But uh, I appreciate you playing ball. And... <laughs> You appreciate me dancing around and not being able to answer the questions. <laughs> I don't know. It's all good. We uh, plenty of sources of info, and uh, we kind of settled into a niche. But um, no, we're being helpful. Um, and there's been some great feedback. Ed, I really appreciate you always joining us and uh, and the kind words there. Um, 
Yeah, so here's one. Now, what's the difference between what a service like Banzoogle offers compared to, say, CD Baby that seems to gather your income from various sales platforms? Yeah, so what CD Baby does is, you know, there's what they're, the main thing that CD Baby does is similar to like TuneCore or DistroKid or there's other platforms out there that, so they, they're digital distributors, so you upload your music. Uh, with the intent on getting it um, made available on iTunes and Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon and all those you know online stores and streaming platforms, um, so you can use CD Baby for that or again those those other platforms. Whereas Banzoogle, we don't offer digital distribution. Uh, we're really uh, there to power your website from behind the scenes and give you tools for your e-commerce to be able to sell music, merch, and tickets directly to your fans. Um, so we don't, we don't send that music to um, online retailers uh, like CD Baby does. Okay, awesome. Um, and that's it. Unless anyone's got a, a last question here. Um, yeah, we've got a bit of Dave's time, so we'll uh, keep that open for about 20 seconds. Um, there is one more, uh, Penny uh, has a question specific to a, a tool in uh, Banzoogle. So Dave, do you mind if I connect you with her after the fact and uh, yep. yeah, no problem. get that taken care of? Um, yeah, no, we very much appreciate everyone joining us. Again, Dave Cool, Banzoogle.com, Director of Artist and Industry Outreach. Um, do check out the site, do check out the service and, and some of the solutions that they can offer because again, it. Uh, borrows very much from what we've been talking about here. Um, yeah, we've got a few titles for you, musicbooksplus.com slash websites. Um, and there, there's some tips as well to make the most of your uh, next webinar experience, which again, make, uh, capitalizing on music conferences coming up late March, uh, start promoting that very shortly. And Dave, appreciate it very much. It's uh, been a pleasure having you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. It was a lot of fun. I uh, appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Uh, we appreciate it. And, yeah, uh, a recording, as I mentioned, will go out in an email about 24 hours from now. NWCWebinars.com, the home base to uh, access this and, uh, well, all of our future sessions as well. And, Penny, I will make sure that Dave gets your email address for your question as specific to Banzoogle. Okay, wait, we've got one more, and this is a good one, uh, Stuart. Uh, Dave, any <laughs> coupon codes for Banzoogle? Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. I can say that there's not a general one that I can give out um, this evening, but I would say that if you are a member of SOCAN or have attended any music conferences, there are generally uh, some promo codes. Um, if uh, if you get in touch with Andrew, he can give you my email address, and uh, I can um, we can figure it out. <laughs> Bingo! Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, back next month and the month after that. NWCWebinars.com. Dave Cool from Banzoogle, and I'm Andrew King with Canadian Musician, and uh, well, we appreciate you taking part.